The absolute dishonesty and fraudulence of most corporate mainstream media is now common knowledge. The rise of alternative and independent media over the last two decades has facilitated a mass awakening of people to the fact that we are systematically lied to and programmed into believing a false version of reality via the modalities of religion, education and mainstream media, all of which are controlled by a power elite via their various global intelligence networks. An important aspect into an individual's awakening to the true nature of our reality is their first step away from the mainstream media narrative and where they land. What is the true story of humanity's history? It's very different from what we've been taught in school. With over a decade as an independent investigative journalist, documentarian and author, moving in the world of alternative and independent media, and as co-founder and creative director of Conscious Consumer Network, I have personally encountered many individuals, groups and media outlets that put out sensationalistic false information. Whether or not they are aware, these purveyors of falsities are secretly serving the powers that be by continuously pumping confusing disinformation into the online world. We simply cannot create a better world on the back of lies. It is the drive to seek the truth and create a better world that motivates me to call out the scammers, frauds and charlatans that lie to and defraud vulnerable people with deliberately misleading information. My name is Karen Irving and most people know me as the editor of the Hoaxted Research blog, but I have a background in psychology. Um, I have a master's degree in social work. And when I was a social worker, which is quite some time ago now, probably about 20 years, um, it was in the height of the satanic panic of the 1990s. Um, and one of the things that occurred to me at that time was that a lot of people seemed to be presenting in my office with symptoms that they couldn't explain, but many of them had been to see previous therapists and believed that they had multiple personality disorder or that they had repressed memories. Some people were coming to me thinking that they must have repressed memories because they had various issues that they didn't understand, um, and could I please help them uncover those memories. Now, that is a really sticky issue. At that time, I had no reason to disbelieve that repressed memories were a thing. So I did, you know, help some people um, trying to uncover what was lost in their minds or what we thought was lost in their minds. But it always struck me as very dicey. It's a little bit like having a dream and then waking up and being mad at your partner because they did something stupid in the dream. You don't know for sure that that person actually did anything stupid. All you know is that you feel that they might have and you had a dream about it. So memory itself, uh, I learned, can be very, very, um, what's the word? Very, very fleeting, very, it, it changes, it can get very blurry. Um, we store memories you know, people believe that we store memories um, in almost like a film reel, you know, that you can sort of look back over your life and remember pretty much everything that happened. That's actually not the case. Most people um, do not have a firm grasp on the memories. Even their own memories shift and change over time. So you might hear someone tell one story one time and another story the next, and that doesn't mean they're lying it means maybe their memory has shifted a little bit and they don't really remember things exactly quite the same way that they did in the beginning. So that was something that came to me, you know, as I worked with people. I didn't have any, you know, particular training in that area. Um, I had training in working with people to talk about emotional issues, um, to talk about the things that disturbed them. But memory itself was never really a big thing in the 1990s until we got to what we called the memory wars. The memory wars refer to um, people realizing, I think, that not all memory is born equal, that 
memories that have been um, retrieved by what we want to call maybe artificial methods, like for instance, um, hypnosis or um, other EMDR, other sorts of therapies like that, that they can be warped and not necessarily accurate. Um, and so we do get, you know, at that time I was getting people coming in and telling me, you know, I went for, my, my grandfather took me for a ride on a broom. It's like, really? Are you sure that's what happened? Because that doesn't sound very plausible to me. So that's the kind of thing that I was, that I was dealing with back then. Um, I later went on, um, I stopped working as a therapist for basically because of government cutbacks. Um, and my job was kind of whipped out from under me. So I turned to the other thing that I happened to do reasonably well, and that was um, editing and writing. And so that's how I got into um, that particular sort of phase of my career. And I've had people ask me, like, what is the relationship between the two? My honest answer is there isn't a relationship. It's just what you do to put bread on the table. So moving along from my own personal perspective, I realized when I got interested in uh, pursuing the truth of the Hampstead case that there was a lot of, um, still a lot of dis disagreement and dispute out there about what constitutes memory, how memories are stored, how they're retrieved, whether people can actually remember things under hypnosis that they can't remember in the rest of their lives. And that made me concerned because I feel as though some people are getting led down the garden path. Um, and I don't say that, you know, therapists are necessarily bad or evil or ill-intentioned even. However, it does seem to me that many therapists are certainly misguided in believing that they have some kind of a magic key that will unlock memories of people who have no memories. Now, the whole concept of repression, um, that was something that was invented by Sigmund Freud. Um, he got it from a psychologist, a psychologist, philosopher, um, you know, basically all round educated guy called Pierre Janet. And Pierre Janet believed that it was possible to store away memories that were so traumatic that we couldn't deal with them. Um, and so that they wouldn't interfere with our day to day life. And Janet also believed that you could bring back those memories via hypnosis. Now, this was at the end of the at the end of the 19th century, so the late 1800s, um, when when Freud was just sort of learning his trade. Um, but there's been a lot of research since then that shows that this really isn't how trauma works. And what most people who experience trauma are actually acutely aware that they've experienced trauma. They know pretty much exactly what happened. They can tell you um, the date that it happened. They can tell you, um, you know, all of the details. Although I have to say, sometimes when, for instance, there's been, I, I don't know, like an explosion or something, there can be gaps, like sort of gaps in that memory because your, your mind just kind of goes into, into overdrive and tunes out. However, that is a very different thing from when people claim that, you know, they've been sexually abused, but they blocked out years and years and years of trauma over and over again, that, and every single time it happened, they blocked it out. That, to me, seems highly improbable. And I think I'm not alone in that. I think the vast majority of people in the psychological, psychiatric, um, neurological community will agree that that just doesn't work that way. People don't go through years of trauma and then just kind of block it out and keep it in some kind of a hidden suitcase someplace where they can then later retrieve it and, and say, oh, look, it, this is exactly how it happened. Doesn't work. Um, so, and the other thing, the interesting thing to me is that these kinds of retrieved memories 
often seem only to have to do with child sexual abuse. They never seem to have to do with memories of war, memories of uh, genocide, people who've been through horrific um, incidents. You know, like I talked once to a little girl who was only uh, five years old when it happened, but she could tell me in great detail about what it was like in the Iran-Iraq war. That is something that she is going to carry with her forever, and she will never be able to escape that memory. Now, it is true that some people push their memories back down into, you know, they, they try to keep them away and they try not to pay attention to them, but that's a very different thing from completely forgetting them. You know, forgetting something is like, where did I leave my keys? This, we're not talking about that kind of forgetting. We're talking about, I don't want to think about that. I don't want to talk about that. That hurts me to talk about, so I won't talk about it. That's the kind of repression that actually does happen. What doesn't happen is this business of memories getting locked away in a suitcase someplace and then being magically unlocked by the right therapist or the right therapy. Um, and there is no magic bullet therapy. So people who believed in Freud's early work, um, his, you know, basically his work that said that that's how trauma works, have seemed to be flooding back into the, uh, the therapeutic community again. And I find that disturbing because what it means is that a whole lot more people are going to be subjected to believing that they experienced things that they didn't experience. And the problem with this, it's not that, you know, I think it's going to upset their parents or it's going to upset their families. The problem with it is that people that experience this, people who go through this retrieved memory process and then begin to believe that they had horrible things happen to them, usually sexually, those people suffer. They suffer terribly because they ha now have to make sense of the fact that everything that they thought they remembered about their happy childhoods or even their unhappy childhoods was a lie. How does that work? How do you even cope with that? And that's why so many people who have had this happen to them wind up committing suicide, they wind up depressed, they wind up more anxious than when they went in in the first place. So that's my little spiel on, you know, the, the whole concept of repressed memories and how I came to, to learn about it, you know, in my, in my professional career. Um, I've done a lot of reading and a lot of research on it since then, and I think that it's a very complex subject. It's not something that we can cover in a you know, one or two hour video, but I do think that it's something that needs to be looked at. And I think the people who are pushing the idea that memory can be uncovered when it didn't exist in the first place, I think those people really need a close look. One of the interesting parts of the Hampstead hoax, um, if people are familiar with it, that's the, that's the situation in which two young children were taken to Morocco to an isolated place with their mother and her boyfriend. And the mother and boyfriend basically beat, uh, burned, suffocated, um, kicked, and threatened and deprived of sleep and deprived of food, these two children, until they could recite quote-unquote memories the way the the mother and her boyfriend wanted them to. And what they wanted them to say was that their father was the leader of a satanic abuse cult that was at their school and church in um, a, a community in North London. So this, in a sense, to me, was like the beginnings of a false memory dialogue. Uh, the children, it's interesting because in the interviews with you can hear when you can hear um, Abraham, the boyfriend, talking to the children. It's quite clear that the little girl who was nine years old at the time does not believe him 
and is going along with him because she's afraid of him. Whereas the little boy has begun to accept that some of the things that Abraham said and, and made him say might have been true. Um, and he's having a hard time kind of letting go of that. This gets into the concept of how memories are created. And I think it's analogous in some ways to the ways in which memories can be created between a client and therapist, although clients and therapists don't usually engage in torture to elicit these memories, um, although they do sometimes use drugs, which apparently Abraham did. Um, so one of the things that happens is that the, the client, or the children in this case, are completely dependent. They feel dependent on the therapist. They feel as though their life would be nothing without the therapist. Well, in the case of the children, they felt as though their lives hung in the balance. They were afraid that they were going to die in Morocco. They were told that they were going to be buried alive and left in the desert. Uh, they had all sorts of threats made to them. So when you look at their behavior on video, you'll see that there's, there's absolutely no sense of fear, no sense of distress, no sense of, um, you know, oh my God, how could this have happened? Nothing like that. They recite it as if they were telling a bedtime story. Yes, and then this happened, and then this happened. And then, you know, the, the, and then the teachers did this, and then my father did this, and then, you know, but they say it in this very, almost kind of, um, you know, trying to convince someone way rather than a, you know, the way that you would expect traumatized children to react, which would be mostly they try not to talk about the thing that happened to them, and they require a lot of prompting. These kids just came right out with it and were like, you know, yada, 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 and bah, 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 bah. You know, they had no problem at all. Um, and that in itself is suspicious. It makes you think, why are these kids completely unlike any other children who have been, you know, studied, who have, who have been in verifiable um, sexually abusive situations, like kids who've been trafficked, you know, they, they don't sound delighted and excited to have an audience. They will try to change the subject. They will, you know, move away from the person that's talking to them. They will not meet their eyes. One of the things that I noticed immediately in the videos of the two children was that they almost stared like this at the person who was interviewing them in the police station. Um, and that's not normal. That is not the behavior that you expect from children who've been sexually abused. So I don't think that the children necessarily had, were completely indoctrinated. I think that they believed that they had to say what they had to say to get through the situation, basically. Um, and later on, the little girl would confirm that in her police interview. And she did say that she had been terrified because she was caught between a rock and a hard place. If the police found out that she was lying, she thought she might actually go to jail. But if the, if, if her step, you know, not her stepfather, but her, her mother's boyfriend heard that she had told the police the truth, she was going to get the crap kicked out of her. So it's really a very difficult thing. One of, the, one of the things that people who believe in the hoax just cling to like it's the last lifeboat on the Titanic is that the little boy um, is a little hesitant to give up the story. Um, he, you know, the police officer has to say a few times, if you tell the truth, you won't get into trouble. Because he clearly, first of all, isn't really sure what to believe anymore. Um, he was eight years old, he was a year younger, and when you see the two children together, you can see that they really are, there is quite an age gap. And that's pretty normal between boys and girls. Everyone, you know, says that girls get, you know, grow about, you know, 
usually are about two years ahead of boys in development. And I think that's more or less correct, having you know been apparent to both genders. Um, but you can see the little boy kind of hesitating and going, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Well, no, no, not all of the babies, no, just some. We, we didn't kill all of the babies, we just killed some. And then, really? I was like, okay, well, fine, none. You know, and that has been touted as evidence of some kind of mind control that the, that the police officer was exercising. I would say the police officer was giving the little boy permission to tell the truth and to know that he wasn't going to get in trouble. I think it's very telling that both of the children said that they hated Abraham. They both said that they thought he was an idiot. Um, and they both said that, you know, he had been the one to make them say these things and that he had accused them, the little boy, it was so sad. He was, and then he accused me and he accused me and he accused me, you know, because to him, it just wasn't fair and it wasn't right. And he was right. He was very absolutely correct. They, he did get accused of things that he hadn't done and he was being made to say things that weren't true. Um, but it's in a sense, it's there, you can see some analogies to a therapist who really, really wants their, their client to come up with these kinds of stories. However, as I say, therapists don't use the brutal techniques that Abraham and Anna did. Usually the typical scenario for a person who has recovered memories is that they go in to see a therapist looking for help for some other completely unrelated thing. Often it might be something like depression, um, it could be anxiety, it could be an eating disorder, it could be you know, trouble coping with their own children, it could be trouble coping with a parent, you name it. Um, and the therapist will offer um, certain types of help, help in the form of something, things like hypnosis, um, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, that's EMDR, uh, which has got, kind of gone a little bit more out of fashion now, but there are variants on it out there still. Um, things that will help the person kind of relax and begin to explore you know, their unconscious mind. Um, and the problem is with that, that the person can be led by a therapist who may not even be aware that they're leading the person. And this is what I'm saying about therapists not all being malevolent. They may be doing it with the best will in the world. Um, the, but the problem is that, you know, the typical situation is that the, um, the, the person comes in looking for help on one thing, they stay with the, client, the therapist for a while, they develop a relationship. Now, to understand this, you have to understand that in the, in the client-therapist relationship, there's a real sense of um, wanting the therapist to approve. There's a sense, there's something that we call transference, which is where the, the person transfers some of their emotions that they might have towards a loving parent onto their therapist. So they want the therapist's approval. They want the therapist to think that they're a, you know, a good person. They want the therapist to like them, to approve of what they say and what they do. So if the therapist says, do you remember anyone you know, in, this, in this hypnotic state? Do you remember anyone you know, touching you in any way? you know, the person may very well say, yeah, even though that might or might not be true. And the, the problem is there's no way of separating the truth from the false. Um, so the therapist expects to find memories of abuse. And sure enough, if you ask the right questions, you're going to start to get what looks like memories of abuse. The problem is, again, that they, they, they might or might not be true. There's no way of knowing, and the, and the person need, often needs to be convinced over time that this is actually what happened to them. 
um, they, the client is in a vulnerable uh, situation. The therapist, their the therapist wants them to open up and and you know sort of talk about the things that bother them, and that's fine. Talking about the things that bother you is is very important and you know an important part of that whole process. But when the things that bother you are things that the therapist has suggested to you in the first place, that gets kind of problematic. So the client has already told the therapist many, many intimate details of their life. They might believe that the therapist has special skills or that they can see into them in a particular way, um, that they can see their real self and, and know them better than they know themselves. This is the power that some people give over to their therapist it's not necessarily a good thing because you know you, because in the hands of someone who is doesn't really understand or value exactly what is happening i e a therapist who doesn't really get what's going on they can begin to think of themselves as a savior they can begin to believe that they have certain powers that they have the ability to discern um you know and i use that in the Angela Power Disney religious sense, you know, discernment as, as a sort of one of the Christian virtues. Um, and as I say, they, the client wants to please the therapist. They want to shape their answers to conform with what they think the therapist might want to hear. So the therapist itself, themselves um, may exert subtle pressure on the client, like saying, this technique works for most of my clients. Um, which kind of implies that if it doesn't work for you, you're a little bit strange. You know, there's something a little bit wrong with you. Um, or, or, or you can be in a group, for example, with a therapist who is, you know, getting people to tell their stories, and, and that's fine. But when the stories begin to veer off into la-la land, and people are beginning to tell all kinds of stories about, you know, the their, the horrors of their own abuse, and it becomes a competition. Like if you think about brothers and sisters competing for their parents' attention, that's how it is or can be in a not very well-run group with a therapist who wants to hear stories about child sexual abuse. And so that kind of thing can happen. Um, the therapist, when the person comes up with a recovered memory, so so you know, so-called, the therapist may praise them and say, oh, that's, that's amazing. Wow, you're really investing in this, in this process. I'm really proud of you for, for, for remembering that. That was very, very brave of you. So faced with that, what is a person going to do? Are they going to just go on and pretend that it didn't happen? Or are they going to try and come up with more interesting stuff, you know, sort of fodder for therapy? it becomes a very, very dangerous cycle. And as I say, it can lead to horrible outcomes for clients, many of whom become, you know, um, suicidal. Um, there have been suicides committed by people who believed that they had been sexually abused when there's absolutely no evidence to show that that ever happened, including from, you know, their brothers and sisters and who shared rooms with them and things. Um, so if a client doubts a memory and begins to sort of go back and say, well, I remembered that, but I'm now wondering, it kind of seems like a dream to me, and I don't really know if that's really how it happened. The therapist might say something like, well, if you stop believing yourself, you're just succumbing to, your, to, to, the, you know, to the abuser's programming. You know, they programmed you to feel that way. So it's a no-win situation for the, for the client, and it's a no-lose situation for the therapist, many of whom become um, specialists in this kind of treatment, and that's all they ever do, so that's all they ever see. You know, um, you know when you're a rat catcher, everything looks like a rat, you know. There's something interesting that has been happening in the, in the United Kingdom recently. Um, it's a type of memory retrieval system um, therapy that has been, uh, it's called matrix re-imprinting. 
Um, it's related to EFT, which is, some people will know that as tapping, where people, like, they tap on different parts of your, you know, of your body and your head and different things. And, and as they do that, they ask you to remember certain things um, or to focus on certain things and allow the, allow the feelings to leave you and so forth. Um, so the matrix re-imprinting therapy to me is a symptom of a problem that therapists have when they believe in recovered memories. And that is that the majority of the therapeutic community has realized that they made a horrible mistake in the 80s and 90s and have basically said they don't believe it anymore. In fact, the um, in 1997, I believe the British Psychiatric Association, although I could have that name wrong, um, issued a, um, a statement saying that they did not approve of recovered memory therapies because they were, you know, they were so dodgy and could result in very poor outcomes. Um, so I think the matrix re-imprinting therapy idea um, it's, it's one of the many sort of techniques that people have developed. Uh, people become very attached to their own ideas. They become attached to the ideas that they've learned. Um, and they believe that they have the magic key to the Pandora's box of, you know, stored memories. Um, the, I think one of the reasons that this has become so popular is that the Num the people who do believe, the therapists who do believe in, um, in, in recovered memory have kind of grouped together. It's, they're a little bit like when muskox see a, a predator approaching, they kind of go into a circle with their you know, heads facing out and their, and their bums facing each other. And, and you know, they're, they gather together and they're, you know, they're not going to let anyone infiltrate their circle. Well, I think that's kind of what happens um, I, and has happened. You'll notice that there are groups of people in the UK, well, and in the US as well, who get together um, and congratulate one another. They reinforce one another's visions of how memory works and how their retrieval processes are the best and how, um, you know, they're actually helping clients and everyone else is um, either satanic or abusers or abuser sympathizers or, you know, everything. So, so basically these people who are in the minority um, believe that believe themselves to be an embattled minority that is fighting a very real battle. Whereas the rest of the world has just kind of carried on without them and doesn't really notice them. And that's the danger to me. That's the danger is that people don't know they're there. Someone could go in looking for therapy and come out thinking that they had been, you know, abused in a, in a satanic cult or something. The matrix re-imprinting therapy is problematic for me on a number of levels because whether you want to call it matrix re-imprinting or, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, -ing, whatever, the problem is it's, it's, it's a false memory implanting technique. I myself was subjected to this therapy through uh, a therapist who was giving it to me. And the, whilst I'm going through it, I'm feeling, well, hang on, this is wrong. I came out the other end of it going, Really? Is that what the, all that was about? I just didn't feel right about it because it was a, I was given a very distinctive, clear, false memory, which they claim is done with the intention of helping people who have gone through trauma. Now, just to give you an idea of um, my scenario, I um, had a, a rough childhood growing up with um, an emotionally unintelligent mother who would project a lot of anger at me, um, sometimes violently. And the therapy that I was given was, I was told to imagine a scenario where my mother gave me the affection and the approval that I sought from her. And as lovely as that memory was, it wasn't a false memory. That sort of thing would never happen because it's out of character for my mother. As much as my 
motherly relationship has matured over the years and things have gotten better, she's still not an overly tactile person that would come and hug me and say the things that were said um, by the therapist. Um, she says, imagine your mother saying this and this and this to you and making you feel good and giving you a hug and telling you that she loves you and giving you a kiss and all that kind of thing. It's just not the behavior that my mother would engage in. Um, you know, over the years, I do believe she has herself realized her behavior perhaps um, had been abusive towards me as a child, but she's never ever the type of person who'd come out and be overly demonstrative about the fact. Um, when we talk about it casually, she doesn't completely um, deny that she could have done things better, but at no point is she ever coming out and giving me the approval that I didn't have or giving me the love that I should have had or making me feel better about what happened. Yeah. So it's, a, it's absolutely, uh, for me, it, as much as the intention of trying to give me some kind of therapeutic relief from past trauma was there, and I believe the therapist was very well intentioned in what she was doing. I think she was also very naive in thinking that it's okay to put false memories into someone's head, even if the intention was to have some sort of therapeutic value, because it was completely, it was a completely false scenario, a completely false dialogue, a completely false memory that was implanted. And what this has done for me is opened up the door to obviously have this dialogue with you because you've been looking at this for quite some time, um, both from um, your counseling training, as well as someone who's done a lot of um, work in the realms of mystery novel writing, which makes you look at different aspects of things. And that, 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 that's a, something we don't get into a lot with you, but I think um, you have to know um, all the variables in a situation and analyze them. And that's what the hoax cases come down to, okay? The, the, the story of the kids in Hampstead is let's look at all the variables and where does the most evidence lie? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And what we've, what we've certainly come up with, as for if, you, if, you, you know, if I can interject with this kind of um, sort of mini analysis is, this, as believable as the children may have appeared to some people, when the initial evidence was laid out, the problem we have is a lack of material evidence and what we have is a lack of uh, supporting testimony from any of the supposed hundred people that may have been affected, parents, children directly, other teachers, because their description of what happened was so horrific that surely if this was going on, there would have been one um, of the other people who would have come forward, be it the children, the parents, the teachers, someone of that 100 people would have come forward in some way to co corroborate um, their story in whatever way they could from their point of view. Not one single person came forward. The lack of physical evidence and of course, the, the overwhelming evidence that there was problems with the source of the story and how these kids were made, obviously tortured in Morocco to deliver the story, they were coached. And that's where my area of expertise comes in because I've dealt with quite a few of these people who've come forward because I'm a journalist and I put media out and I've had several platforms and um, you know, whatever my version of uh, or my testimonies or, or, or my interviews might mean to anybody, they've somehow drawn people out of the woodwork who've come forward and have sat in front of me. Sometimes I do several recordings with them, but eventually I will realize that there is a problem with what they're saying. And that's prompted me to realize that as horrific as, um, it may sound. There are definitely people out there who are making up stories about abuse for some, with some sort of agenda in mind. They're, they're actually willing to go to the extent of creating these horrific instances, blaming, falsely accusing people of the most horrendous things because there is another agenda at hand. It could be financial motivation. It could be, as I have discovered, people who have an agenda to acquire an external um, celebrity, you know, um, enhance their um, social equity. Um, there's all sorts of different reasons why people do this. And of course, there's also some people who have genuinely been abused. Okay, why do, I, I looked it up once. Why do people make up stories of abuse? And something I found very interesting is these people may have genuinely been abused at some points in their life. And so they create a, a fictitious story where they channel the anger um, and experience of that abuse into a story um, so that they, you know, uh, 
that it, it, there is a story there that they've been abused, but it's not necessarily the facts of how they were abused or what happened. And I found that that's very common. It's, it's you know, a lot of people have been abused in life, um, but not everybody is able to talk about it. And some people actually make up stories as, as a way of channeling um, that pain and anger. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think, interestingly, I think the internet has, has a lot to answer for in that regard. I think what, as you say, there are people who may have been, may have experienced abuse in one form or another, but if you want to be heard on the internet, you have to have a very, very big voice. And to have a big voice, you have to have a big story. And a big story these days um, can't just be, well, my father, you know, my father had sex with me or my brother, you know, sexually molested me when I was a, when I was a child. Those are very, very real types of abuse. But to get any attention on the internet, it has to be bigger than that. It has to be, I was abused by a satanic cult. Hundreds of people abused me. Um, you know, hundreds of people... Uh, you know, hundreds of people with ties to the government or who were VIPs or who drove around in, in Rolls Royces or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, they all abused me and, and were, you know, and were completely, you know, they used me like their own toy. These kinds of stories, I'm not saying that VIP abuse never happens and I'm not saying that, you know, other more more I don't know what you want to call it extreme like maybe group groups of people like I'm thinking Colin Batley in, in Wales those kinds of things definitely happen they're horrific but I think for people on the internet I can think of many many people who have tried to glom on to the concept of child sexual abuse as their ticket to fame on the internet and yeah, that's, it's kind of sick that our society has created that sort of victim culture where we, you know, I, if you think about shows, I don't know, like I grew up in, in North America and, in, in, you know, in the 80s and 90s. And if you think about shows like um, Geraldo or um, Oprah, where it's like the person who has suffered the most gets the biggest ovations. And, you know, the, the, the host on the TV show is, you know, weeping over their situation. And, oh, my God, it's all so terrible. And, oh, look at this person. And from that, they can often, you know, um, gain book contracts. They can do all sorts of things that they might not otherwise have been able to do if they had simply said, you know, um, I was sexually abused as a child. Like, that's hardly even worth noting these days. And that, to me, is awful. Yeah. Because people who have been sexually abused need the need the resources and the attention that is currently going to these grandstanders. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. It's very profitable to be a victim these days, especially with um, GoFundMe campaigns and all this kind of fundraising efforts that, you know, if, if you get your story big enough, you can make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And um, I've even uh, dealt directly with people who have been guests on our network and whom we've dealt with behind the scenes offering um, services and assistance in various media capacities who have, who claim that they're victims of sexual satanic ritual abuse or, or childhood sexual abuse or, or, or some kind of very dark and, and they've been through some suffering and man, they are such victims, you know, yeah. and um, one particular person told me that they're making $15,000 per speaking event, whether or not that's true, I don't know. It might just be a brag on their part to, mm. to obviously boost this image of their credibility. But because I don't think they've got any credibility, I've actually, you know, found that um, when it seems too big to be true, it probably is. Um, there's nobody making that scale at any speaking events other than perhaps David Icke. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and specifically about that topic only, no, people don't make that kind of money on the, the topic of um, satanic ritual abuse, uh, not at one, not per speaking event. And then, um, because of course it's one lie on top of another, 
this whole story comes apart where I don't even believe this person was satanically ritually abused. And often we'll use the fact that they're abused as a tool to manipulate you. This particular person, same person I'm talking about here, actually turned around um, when we questioned her about something in a, in a direct way, um, actually said, oh, you remind me of my abusive father. They will throw it at you in, in a way to manipulate you so that you back off or, or go along with whatever agenda they're trying to, you know, drag you along. Yeah. So there's this, it's, it's an, an interesting gauntlet. And the thing is, the examples are so numerous that there's a clear and definitive pattern now that we can identify what is going on. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, if it was one or two instances of sick people doing this, it would probably not even be worth the mention. But the reason I'm doing this is because there's a catalog now of people who've come out with hoaxes, different stories. I mean, just in our immediate sort of uh, grasping, we've got the, um, the Holly Gregg hoax, the Hampstead um, whistleblowers hoax, um, a number of false claimants, yeah. of people claiming to have been satanically ritual abused all over the internet now. Becky, Becky Percy, Fiona Barnett, um, Angela Power Disney, there's dozens, you know, yeah. all over yeah. the place. And each time when they don't get the attention they want for one particular you know, story, they'll invent another. Um, and it's worse and it's bigger and it's more, you know, and they, they develop, you know, followings of people who firmly believe them and will attack others on their behalf. Um, it's a very, it's a very scary phenomenon uh, and yeah. it's, <clears throat> it's escalated by the internet and the ability, our ability to basically connect with one another by the thousands instantly. Yes. There's that, there's that aspect, of course, the false stories, but there's also the other aspect, which, which I think adds fuel to the fire, which is the therapists who fuel this insanity. Because obviously the, the therapists um, that kind of offer these uh, matrix re-imprinting therapies or, or, or EFT or, or attachment therapies to help people supposedly deal with whatever imagined trauma they have, they're the ones who are somehow validating these false stories yes. by um, you know, e even trying to apply a therapy to these people who have supposedly been um, or you know, whether abused, but probably mm -hmm. not the way we think. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not even I'm not even necessarily saying that all of these people invented the stories out of whole cloth either. I hold the I hold the therapists responsible um, <clears throat> unless proven otherwise because that seems to be the pattern. People do not just develop recovered memories out of the blue. There is always a therapist involved. Um, yeah. And that therapist will often do things like I had one client years ago who came to me because she began to worry um, and she had a kind of a, a falling out with her previous therapist because this woman was having my client dissociate in her office and sort of show off all of her various um, so-called so alters and calling in her colleagues to come and look, basically turning her into a kind of circus act, you know. Um, and when I called the other therapist on it, she just said, well, I didn't know any better. I'm really sorry. I'll never do it again. Well, that's great, but you have really put a monkey wrench into this person's life. Sorry, a spanner. I know that in England that's the that's interpretation. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. But yeah, I mean, that really, to go to a therapist and be betrayed by the therapist as well as any other betrayals that you may have experienced in your life, that's, it's just a horrific thing. You know, and I do think that you're right that I think the therapists and the therapy is at the bottom of how all of this comes about. And they're like, they work like a little factory churning out these alleged victims. Um, it's, it's disturbing. Yeah. The other thing is that what I think you made a really good point about, like in some ways, the false memory that, that, you know, that the person tried to induce in you seemed very benign, but in other ways, it's very, very dangerous. Like if you're say if you're telling someone that the person who abused them is actually their best friend and thinks they're wonderful and you can get that person to believe that over a period of time, that enables that person to actually be abused. Like what kind of therapy is that? 
that's it's so wrong yes exactly exactly it's, it, it creates a whole bunch of schisms in a people's psyche because after a while if a person's got you know unquestionable faith in their therapist and mm-hmm. these memories start settling in there's several there's several things that happen here first off the person who supposedly thinks they've been abused actually doesn't know anymore what is reality and what isn't then think about if you meet a person who has been through this therapy or has supposedly been abused one of these uh, alleged victims um developing a relationship with them is incredibly difficult because they themselves don't really understand uh, a lot of what's happened to them a lot of it might have been made up could you ever trust someone like that in a relationship could you ever be intimate with someone like that so it creates a person who has problems with uh, developing trustworthy relationships, or that could be um, developing relationships with people based on false information about themselves. And then, of course, as you said, there's the, hold on a second, uh, let's, let's, let's just pretend this person who's abused us is actually a good person, because we've dropped in a whole bunch of good memories about them, false good memories to, you know, re-imprint, you know, using a language, the matrix of our past, um, with good memories as opposed to having all these bad memories. When you come across that person again, um, sh- you know, this is the way I come in with a flight and flight mechanism. It, our memories work so that we remember the bad stuff. So that if we burn our hand on a hot plate, we know not to go there again because we remember that. That sticks in our mind, right? Yeah. Now, if you've kind of erased that or, or re-imprinted that with, you know, good stuff, like if you put your hot hand on the hot plate, it's going to, you know, tickle like being licked with kittens or something. You know, you're going to burn the hell out of your hand. And it's the same as if you came across the, a person who had abused you and you've only got good things about them because you've, you've worked through all that with matrix re-imprinting therapy. You're not going to be cautious of them as you should be, all right? You're going to perhaps put yourself in a situation which would facilitate that abuse happening again. So there's a, there's a whole bunch of very tricky areas here with that kind of therapy. And when you look at it, um, it's, it's, it actually, you know, when we dealt, when we spoke with Sandra Fecht, who's the woman who claims to invented this therapy, when we spoke to Sandra Fecht, she claimed that she invented it and that she taught it to a whole bunch of other therapists who are now in turn, it's, it's almost like, um, a matrix scheme, you know, it's, it's, they, then they now teach it to other therapists who then become therapists and perhaps eventually they treat it to other people. So it's a multi-level marketing scheme. And this very dodgy therapy has gotten out into the public arena like this. And yep. it's now so widespread that I, I'm, I'm amazed that there aren't more therapists who don't have the, Oh, I mean, I'm not even a trained therapist, but I can see that th- this is a problematic therapy and that it's, it would cause psychological issues. Surely a psychologist, if you are a trained psychologist, would be able to identify that this is problematic. But what I'm seeing is it's a lot of people who aren't even really trained psychologists who just kind of, you know, I don't know, or, you know, want a new direction in life or something. They go along for these training courses mm-hmm. and they, suddenly they come out and they, they train therapists and whatever. And, and there is no regulating body, certainly not within the UK, because I've contacted them all, who oversee these therapeutic practices and these therapists. There's no ombudsman. Um, there's no sort of governing body that, but what they do all say, okay, when you talk to them about these therapies is that they do not approve or recommend them at all, but they have no controlling body over counselors or therapists who engage in these kind of therapies. That's right. Yes. The, um, it's interesting that you talk about Sandra Effect because the, um, uh, the College of Registered Psychotherapists and Registered Mental Health Therapists of Ontario put in a, um, a complaint about Sandra Effect and the um, Superior Court of Justice of Ontario, which I'm trying to think what the UK equivalent to that would be, because we have provinces that have their own superior courts and then it goes up to um, fed the federal level. Um, but anyway, it's um, probably not relevant. Okay. Um, so there was, they basically tried to shut her down and they got a judgment, a ruling from the superior court and said that, um, and, and she agreed that she will, uh, keep appropriate, um, 
treatment records, um, that she will make her client sign consent forms, which kind of implies that she wasn't before, that she will not treat a person by prayer or spiritual means during any appointment, um, not to discuss her beliefs regarding satanic ritual abuse or reptilians during any appointment, um, and that any discussions pertaining to SRA or reptilians occur only when she is counseling or, or treating by um, or prayer uh, in accordance with the tenets of Miss Fecht's religion. So in other words, she's not allowed to bring a whole bunch of woo-woo shit into her, into her treatment room. Um, and they, this was in, I believe, 2017. Now, I looked online, and I can still see that Sandra Fecht seems to be accepting clients. Yeah. What is she telling these clients? I don't know. Um, I think it would be very interesting to find out. Um, and I strongly suspect that she has not ceased and desisted because I've seen her name listed in various um, dissociation and, um, you know, and, um, you know, dissociation therapy conferences and so forth um, in, in the, you know, intervening years. So it's, it, it is like, a cancer in the therapeutic world. Um, if anything is going to convince people that therapists are a bunch of woo nutcases, it's going to be this. Mm. And frankly, it's not. It's really, really bad for clients. Yes. So, what is happening? You know, how is, how is this even happening? Sandra Fecht has actually admitted to us that she is still seeing clients, but she's not calling a therapist anymore. The honest truth is that. The type of therapy that she's teaching, she, she admitted to us as well that, that she made it up. Okay, She told us, she, she created this. She says, oh, I've got a master's degree and I've got years of training and therefore I created this therapy and taught other people how to do it. There's been no trials or testing done on anybody. So there's no trials. There's no sort of, um, you know, you would do clinical trials if you're releasing a drug into the marketplace because it, it, it's the law. It's got to happen. Um, but, you know, surely if you bring an invasive therapy like that into practice in the mainstream, surely there would be some kind of um, experiential trials where people would be monitored and go, go to, for it to be recognized. Yeah. You can't just say, oh, I made up a therapy and now I'm going to, you know, recycle it, package it up and sell it all for more than it's worth to other people who want to use this therapy as a revenue income and as well to indoctrinate people into the belief that we actually have the right to somehow implant false memories into the minds of vulnerable people. And many of these therapists who are getting trained are not psychologists or, or, or psychiatrists. They have no form of training whatsoever. They're just people who anyone can go on one of these courses and anybody can then afterwards claim that they're a trained counselor or therapist um, capable of giving uh, EFT um, as well as matrix re-imprinting therapy. And there's, you know, what, what happens to people who go to these supposed newly trained counselors who have no real formal training or formative experience, who actually don't know the ins and outs of how these therapies can negatively affect people because they just don't have the training to understand. They don't have the lingo. They don't have the nomenclature within their psyche to mm -hmm. get their head around this this process that they're now believed in, in, in doing to people. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. And the problem is that people can't defend themselves against this because they don't, they don't know what it is, you know? <clears throat> they, don't know that, <clears throat> they don't know that it's wrong necessarily. Um, they may think that they're being helped in some way, even though, I mean, there's the idea in therapy that you have to suffer to make progress. Um, I don't necessarily think that's always true, but it's out there. Um, if you watch enough movies about, you know, people who have psychoanalysts, you know, there's always the, the horrible, <clears throat> you know, the horrible psychoanalytic breakthrough where the person is sobbing on the floor and, you know, and the therapist is patting them on the back or telling them to, you know, go deeper and remember more, you know, <clears throat> and there's nothing that tells us, Hey, is that really the best way to help a person? You know, um, I was interested to note that Sandra Fecht also, although she is in a small town in Ontario called Aurelia, um, I've actually been there for a lacrosse tournament, believe it or not, <laughs> um, <laughs> many years ago. Um, 
she actually um, assisted Abraham and Ella, and um, as well as Sabine and um, Belinda, Sabine McNeil and Belinda McKenzie, who were at that time putting about the Hempstead hoax. She assisted them by doing an interview at, and you know, introducing a couple of clients who uh, claimed to have been victims of cult abuse. And they used this to kind of back up their story. Um, mm -hmm. So that is the other danger. Um, yes. Pretty much anyone, you, you can say, you know, she's got a degree in counseling. That doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that, <clears throat> that she can do the things that she thinks she can do, you know, that she can actually help anyone. That, this is how I actually came on to um, this sort of path was in, during the reporting of the Sabine trial, you wrote in one of your articles, you mentioned that Sabine, um, one of her defensive statements was, well, I believe in it because a therapist in Canada told me it was true. Yeah. And basically claiming <clears throat> that the reason she had the mindset that she had, the reason why um, she believed that the stories of the kids could be true was based upon some of the things that and some of the discussions or some of the views held by Sandra Fecht. And this is um, what she said in court. This is what you reported on your website uh, because you were in court um, re recording. And this is how I, I initially was like, right, this is why I need to talk to you about this because I've experienced the, um, the Sandra angle from another way. I've, I've, we've worked with her intimately on various levels, mm -hmm. both in front of and behind the camera. Uh, we've worked with a number of the people that she's trained and, and people that promote her. And I've had this therapy, which comes from her, mm -hmm. um, from one of the people who have indirectly been trained by her. So I've gotten to experience what this therapy is all about. And I had problems with it from the get go. Mm -hmm. There was, you know, and I, I just at the time was really still investigating and, and navigating my way through the, the sort of psychological minefield of this because the one thing I don't ever want to do is I never want to be disrespectful for, for people who have been genuinely abused because yes. I know what it's like. I've been there. But I also feel that you do a great disservice to people who have genuinely been abused and who have genuine stories by coming out and making up a whole bunch of rubbish and flooding the internet with it. Because what happens is people who genuinely should be heard or perhaps genuinely need support, they are either too afraid to come forward or they don't get it because there's so much other rubbish out there. And this is the, the truly pernicious side of this whole thing is that uh, it impacts negatively on people who perhaps um, need the most help. Yes, exactly. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I completely agree. I've, I've talked to so many people who are survivors of child sexual abuse, and they all say, why are these people doing this? You know, it, make, it, it does a whole bunch of things. It, it takes away resources. It also makes real abuse survivors feel as though, first of all, they don't have enough of a story to be important, but also it makes them, it can make them look like idiots, yeah. you know, because, oh, you're one of those who, you know, I suppose you're going to tell me the aliens did it, you know, or, you know, the satanic, you know, cult down the road. Um, and so it, it helps to lessen their credibility in the public sphere at a time when th what they need is more care um, and they're just not getting it. Mm. Um, and, and that's shocking to me. Yeah. I, I, yeah. That, that I suppose, again, is the real reason why we need to look at this. My, my entry into this, and, um, you know, it, it's kind of weird how we've ended up on, on, on a similar path here, because for those who, who have actually watched Karen and I, you will know that Karen and I have often been on opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of our views on certain things. And, you know, we probably still have very different views on a number of uh, things. You know, I, I've um, never said that we all had to agree on the same thing, but everybody has a piece of the story to tell. And is for me, I'm, I've now come to a point in my own personal journey where I've recognized a lot of the value that you, Karen, have in terms of your personal experience in Canada as a therapist, your sort of background and history, um, and also how you've come to be involved with fronting what can only, I mean, I know what you've been through. I know, because I've, I've been through similar things with the trolling, the hatred, the anger, 
um, the attacks from people when really all you're trying to do um, is add some sense to some very, very crazy and emotive darkness uh, and lies that have been put out into the public. And as you said, the, there's the, the pernicious angle of this is so much attention goes into these hoaxes that real victims are left stranded. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. And I think, I think you're, it's, it is curious that the two of us would actually get together because it's not something that I would have imagined even a year ago. <laughs> um, however, I also do believe that it's important to, you know, kind of reach across the barbed wire sometimes and say, look, you know, there might be things in which we can cooperate, things where we might share views and be able to contribute to one another's understanding a little bit more. Um, I think I actually had not known about the matrix reimprinting thing until you told me about it. And I think it is a shockingly poor idea. Um, yeah. It's, you know, it's just something that is, is just really not good. I also appreciate that you have been willing to kind of shift your views in certain areas. And I think I have as well, you know, I think we've managed to kind of, um, you know, meet some, meet some kind of detente um, at, at a certain point. And, it, that's unusual because actually yesterday I spent much of the day compiling um, a bunch of um, abuse that I had received uh, because the police had asked me for it. Um, and so that was kind of going through, the, through all of that was just like, oh my God, you can't even express an opinion on the internet without some nutcase saying they're going to like chop you up and put you in a wood chipper. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, you yeah. know? Um, that is the unfortunate thing. And, you know, just, 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 just as a, I don't know whether I'll use this comment or not, but just as an, a, by, a by and by statement, the, the thing that sort of kept me off um, sort of wanting to look at this further, and this is, the, this is the other thing about the ugliness that, and the abuse, is the thing that made me not want to look at this any further was I looked at some of the really angry haters and the ugliness that were literally vomiting um, on the internet. Um, that was supposedly in your camp. Now, they've got nothing to do with you. They're just people who like to frequent your blog, and they can be a little bit ugly. And, and you know how ugly they are because they, at times, turn on you too. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, yeah. But that's kind of what makes you want to go, well, look, if, if, if that's what that camp is up to. I don't want to be a part of it, and I'm not going to look any further into anything they say, no matter how legitimate what you're saying yeah. might be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that is so the problem, yeah. It is it is a real problem. And it took me a long because of that, it took me a long time. In fact, I only felt comfortable really approaching you when I saw you sort of, okay, well, this is who you are. You've stuck your face out there. And you know, you're not a big hairy monster. And um I'm I'm quite okay perhaps communicating with you and discussing some of what I know. Yeah. But you know yourself. I myself have suffered great consequences personally for providing a service to people who've pushed this hoax. You know, it's, it's, it's in, impacted on my life uh, in, in a very negative way. And the one thing I no longer wish to be doing is um, creating any kind of environment where anybody can be falsely accused of ridiculous things. Yeah, that's important. Because, yeah. you know, we've had that. I, I was... One thing not, want, not wanting to do, not wanting to be like mainstream media with the network I created... One thing I didn't want to do was go to any of our broadcasters and say, oh, you can't say that, you can't do this, this is our opinion, so you have to you know, toe the line with what we believe. It was, okay, I'm not going to censor anybody. You're intelligent people. Please be discerning. Try to do your own research. It's all part of the consensual operating format they have to agree to before being a broadcaster. And in there, we empower them to you know, be responsible, take, be accountable, um, do their research. But obviously, we can't control what they do or what they say. And we can't control their interests or where their narrative on a subject wishes to go. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we have provided a space for a number of people who've, who've just come up with, come onto the network and spewed the biggest load of rubbish. And I have actively come out and said, look, I know that it was rubbish and I'm sorry for creating that space, but we don't know what people are going to say before they say it. So, I'm, you know, um, and we can't censor people because that's part of our um, creative uh, structure is that we're not, we're not there to tell people what is true and what's not. We want people to be able to discern for themselves. 
Yeah. So this well, is one of one of the issues when you're when you are a host in a situation like this, and I I feel that in some ways the blog has been a host to a mm. lot of people. When you are that kind of host, I have caught royal shit from various people because I've allowed people that they didn't like to comment on the blog. And my feeling is that as long as the person is not breaking any laws or harassing any person or creating death threats um, on the blog, I will allow the comment. What they do when they're away from the blog, I cannot control. I yeah. can express opinions, but I can't. And that is the problem is that I began to feel, that's part of why I decided, I mean, first of all, the Hempstead hoax had kind of droned on down to a little, uh, you know, to a little trickle rather than a flood. Um, and so there's, there are things, you know, there are things happening, but they're behind the scenes mostly and can't really be reported on. And if I continued to write daily, I would just be, you know, reiterating the same things over and over and over again. So that plus... Um, I began to feel as though publishing daily was just providing more fuel for some people who felt that they, you know, their hobby was basically getting on the internet and making other people cry. Yeah. And to me, that's not okay. Mm -hmm. That's not an okay way to spend your time. So I publish now when the mood strikes me or when a story occurs, basically, when something comes up that I think is important to mention to people who follow the, the Hampstead hoax. Other than that, I am off. I basically have other things going on in my life and I'm off doing them. Um, yeah. So. Well, Karen, I must say you've done a fantastic job with this and um, your resolve and your strength and keeping a clear and level head and looking at the facts and your reporting on the Sabine case, which is where I was kind of like stepped over the fence and realized, all right, this, this woman's got some skill and intelligence. She's, she's probably worth at some stage reaching out to and really let's, let's forget our personal past and history and, and, and the grievances and just lay all of what we know on the table and pick through it. And we, you and I have been doing that for quite some time now, picking through, seeing what each other knows, contributing to each other's knowledge through my experience with various people behind the scenes that, you know, have, are attacking you still, um, that have attacked you. Yeah. Or, or, or people who perhaps um, are adding to the psychosis, this online psychosis of utter rubbish, uh, you know, as the Hampstead case has been. And it's important because the, the amount of people that I've had exposure to is so vast um, mm -hmm. doing what I do, you know, whatever label you want to put on that, you know, creator of a network or as an in investigative journalist and I've had to like interact and meet and some of them personally spend time with so many of these oh, nefarious characters that I've developed um, a, a knowledge and a history and an experience base that I think um, really does help contribute to for whatever it might be worth to anybody you know who, who watches this but it really helps contribute to people's understanding of what these nefarious characters are up to and what's really going on. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's so many of them. I mean, starting from Kevin Annett, who's stayed in my house twice, you know, um, one of the sort of really heinous people with regards to what's gone on in Canada. I just, I feel ashamed that I ever worked with him. And then there's people like, I went all the way to Scotland to, to meet um, Robert Green. And I dragged my case from the bus station to all the way to the event and I wasn't even let in to interview him and he met me at the hotel afterwards. And the, the, what I went through to get that interview. And in the end, he's turned around and himself has said, look, you know, I'm sorry I ever got involved. The, the extremeness of some of the, of the circumstances that I've been in, in dealing with so many nefarious characters in this movement, in this particular circle and in circles which overlap into this one, mm -hmm. um, I just feel it's about high time that we start unpacking all of this nastiness and ugliness and, and start shining light into those dark corners and looking at what is legitimate and what's not, what is benefiting people and what is actively hurting them. Even if it's just in creating sick mind fodder that can be perversely uh, projected on the internet, I think we need to really have a look at what is going on, what is real, what's not, and um, unpack this whole big bag. I agree. I agree completely. Yeah. And I, yeah, thank you so much for reaching out too. I think that was a brave thing to do. Mm -hmm.